Everywhere you go in our solar system, even our next door neighbor, Venus, they say we're sister planets. Lucky the resemblance doesn't include weather. Otherwise, we'd get seriously burned. Venus may be our nearest neighbor, but somehow its weather is radically different from ours. The second planet from the sun is a cross between a toxic waste dump and Death Valley, but even worse. So it's, it's really, it's almost a, a planetary definition of hell. The temperature is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure on the surface is the same as half a mile below the Earth's ocean. And if that's not enough, the upper atmosphere of Venus is choked with sulfuric acid clouds and winds clocked at 250 miles an hour. To get a comparison for Venus, the best thing to do is climb inside of your oven and crank it up. And then in terms of pressure, you, you're talking about deep sea diving. It's like nothing. There's nothing comparable on the Earth. It's just a, a very, very extreme uh, object. On Venus, there's just no escaping the heat. If you built up a hot spot on Venus, uh, the massive atmosphere would just carry that heat away and spread it around. But Venus shines so brightly in the night sky because its thick clouds reflect almost all the sunlight it receives. In fact, some early scientists assumed Venus would have moderate Earth-like temperatures. When we went by Venus in 1962 with a spacecraft, we thought we would find a surface at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, sort of like Miami, Florida. We were dead wrong. Something else must be at work on Venus. But what? So why doesn't Venus cool off the same way Earth does? On the Earth, for example, we have sunlight coming in, hitting the surface of the Earth. Earth warms up a little bit, but the oxygen and the nitrogen in the atmosphere don't impede the light. So when it gets released out in the infrared, it goes right through the atmosphere and leaves and goes into space. But on Venus, the atmosphere is 97% carbon dioxide, giving a whole new meaning to the greenhouse effect. It becomes very, very hard for the surface to get its energy out. So Venus really taught us a lesson, that if you have a blanketing gas, a greenhouse gas, it can warm up the atmosphere tremendously. But why does Venus have so much more CO2 in its atmosphere than Earth? The two have much in common. They're even called sister planets. They're almost the same size, have roughly the same amount of carbon, and billions of years ago, both had lots of water. But eons ago, their paths mysteriously diverged. On Earth, water fostered life. The Earth has most of its carbon in life forms, in the trees and the animals. But if you took all that carbon that's in the near surface rocks and burned it up or released it, uh, you would then create a, an atmosphere very much like Venus. Venus's close proximity to the sun made it too hot to sustain liquid water. Instead, its water evaporated into the atmosphere, trapping the heat deposited by the sun and creating a runaway greenhouse effect. Once in the atmosphere, the water molecules were exposed to solar ultraviolet rays that broke the molecules apart. It really wasn't recognized by the scientific community how important the greenhouse effect was prior to going by Venus and seeing this amazing place where it was 900 degrees Fahrenheit, not 90. It took several doomed missions to Venus to figure it out. Starting in the 1960s, both the United States and the Soviet Union sent unmanned probes past the planet and down to its surface. It didn't take long before Venus crushed and burned them. Then, in 1981, the Soviet lander Venera 13 set a record for survival on the surface of Venus. Two hours and seven minutes. It was able to take pictures and samples of the surface before being overcome by the heat. You're sitting there with this 900 degrees Fahrenheit heat all around you. It's going to get in there and bake you after a while. Scientists one day hope to send a probe to Venus that can survive its hellish environment to help us confirm our theory of how this planet went astray. Because if circumstances were just a little different, 
our sister planet might just be our twin. Remove our atmospheric shield, and you're on the road to hell. As soon as you're heated up uh, to something like 400 degrees or so, you probably start getting some smoldering smoke, and way before it gets to 900 degrees, the Earth would burst into flames because all the oxygen around. Once the oceans boiled away, the carbon locked in rocks on the ocean floor would cook and over millions of years re-enter the atmosphere. Probably if you came back to the Earth system after this happened, you'd find a planet looking much like Venus. We're a long ways away from such a drastic change, but it's sobering to look at Earth's sister planet when the sister planet went on a very different track than we did. So cosmic forces turned Venus into a planetary barbecue. But on this violent stormy world, time and the elements have produced some of the strongest thunderstorms ever measured. Welcome to Saturn. Lightning cuts the sky. This violent weather system grows bigger than the entire United States as it pummels the atmosphere with the most powerful lightning ever seen. Except this lightning can't be seen. Because these bolts are electrifying the skies over Saturn. Despite the raw power of Saturn's lightning, scientists have been unable to see it partly because Saturn's rings are too bright. The rings are so bright, uh, if you were on the night side of Saturn, it would be considerably brighter than the Earth under a full moon. But Saturn also hides its lightning within thick, choking clouds of ammonia. It's probably 100 kilometers down that the lightning is happening, and that complicates uh, seeing the lightning flashes. But the lightning is there. And scientists know it because they've heard it. Radio wave detectors on the Cassini orbiter have recorded the sound of Saturn's lightning. We can hear the static of lightning just as you could with an AM radio uh, going down the highway on, you know, on Earth. And this static reveals the power of the lightning that we can't see. You can measure the energy in those radio waves and compare it with the energy that your uh, radio picks up when there's a, a thunderstorm around on Earth. And the Saturn ones are big. They are more powerful, maybe a hundred times. And Earth's lightning can help scientists understand how storms work on Saturn. Within Earth's storm clouds, just like in Saturn's, updrafts drive moisture higher, causing ice to form. These ice crystals rub against each other, take on a positive charge, and become attracted to negatively charged water droplets lower in the cloud. This sets the stage for a potentially powerful discharge of energy. Once you get that charge separation that builds up so intensely, that uh, some theorize that it can be as strong as 100 million volts, that the cloud then must release that energy. On Saturn, the same thing happens on a much larger scale. In fact, the lightning is 100 times stronger than Earth's. That's a staggering 10 billion volts of electricity. Thunderstorms in Saturn's southern hemisphere span thousands of miles and can last as long as a month. But scientists aren't sure what makes Saturn's storms bigger and longer lasting. It could be Saturn's supersaturated atmosphere. Probably the fact that there's more water in the atmosphere, pound for pound, on Saturn is, is, makes the storms bigger. More water droplets means more friction which means bigger lightning bolts. 
But energy emerging from the planet may also contribute to the power in Saturn's thunderstorms. It turns out that where Lightning Alley is on Saturn is a place where the winds are flowing the slowest. If you go deep down in the atmosphere, you'll see the same winds as you do up high. It's a place where the energy being released deep down below can make it on up to the upper atmosphere without being sheared apart and allows storm systems to be organized. Earth's atmosphere isn't built that way. So as violent as our storms get, they're nothing compared to the systems on Saturn. Even a run-of-the-mill mega thunderstorm on Saturn would devastate us here. A Saturn-sized thunderstorm on the Earth would mean a thunderstorm that grows to cover all of North America and presumably has very strong winds and rain. Um, this is something that's unprecedented um, on the Earth. Saturn's hyperviolent thunderstorms are proof that our planetary neighbors have weather far more ferocious than ours. But the laws of physics that create Saturn's storms are the same laws that create our own weather. Massive dust storms, unrelenting winds, killer lightning, powerful hurricanes, and searing heat. All across the immense reaches of time and space, energy is being exchanged, transferred, released in a great cosmic pinball game we call our universe. How does energy stitch the cosmos together? And how do we fit within it? We now climb the power scales of the universe. From atoms, nearly frozen to stillness, to Earth's largest explosions. From stars, Colliding, exploding, to distant realms so strange and violent, they challenge our imaginations. Where will we find the most powerful objects in the universe? Today, energy is very much on our minds as we search for ways to power our civilization and serve the needs of our citizens. But what is energy? Where does it come from? And where do we stand within the great power streams that shape time and space? Energy comes from a Greek word for activity or working. In physics, it's simply the property or the state of anything in our universe that allows it to do work. Whether it's thermal, kinetic, electromagnetic, chemical, or gravitational. The 19th century German scientist Hermann von Helmholtz found that all forms of energy are equivalent, that one form can be transformed into any other. The laws of physics say that in a closed system, such as our universe, energy is conserved. 
It may be converted, concentrated, or dissipated, but it's never lost. James Prescott Joule built an apparatus that demonstrated this principle. It had a weight that descended into water and caused a paddle to rotate. He showed that the gravitational energy lost by the weight is equivalent to heat gained by the water from friction with the paddle. That led to one of several basic energy yardsticks called a joule. It's the amount needed to lift an apple weighing 100 grams one meter against the pull of Earth's gravity. In case you were wondering, it takes about 100 joules to send a tweet. So tweeted a tech from Twitter. The metabolism of an average sized person going about their day generates about 100 joules a second or 100 watts the equivalent of a 100 watt light bulb. In vigorous exercise, the power output of the body goes up by a factor of 10, one order of magnitude, to around a thousand joules per second, or a thousand watts. In a series of leaps by additional factors of 10, we can explore the full energy spectrum of the universe. So far, the coldest place observed in nature is the Boomerang Nebula. Here, a dying star ejected its outer layers into space at 600,000 kilometers per hour. As the expanding clouds of gas became more diffuse, they cooled so dramatically that their molecules fell to just one degree above absolute zero, the total absence of heat. That's around a billion trillionths of a joule. That makes the signal sent by the Galileo spacecraft as it flew around Jupiter seem positively hot. By the time it reached Earth, its radio signal was down to 10 billion billionths of a watt. Now jump all the way to 150 billionths of a watt. That's the amount of power entering the human eye from a pair of 50-watt car headlamps a kilometer away. Moving up a full seven powers of ten, moonlight striking a human face adds up to 300 thousandths of a watt. That's roughly equivalent to a cricket's chirp. From there, it's a mere five powers of ten to the low wattage world of everyday human technologies. Put 10 100 watt bulbs together. At 1000 joules per second, 1000 watts, that roughly equals the energy of sunlight striking a square meter of Earth's surface at noon on a clear day. Gather 200 bulbs. 20,000 watts is the energy output of an automobile. A diesel locomotive, 5 million watts. An advanced jet fighter, 75 million watts. An aircraft carrier, almost 200 million watts. The most powerful human technologies today function in the range of a billion to 10 billion watts, including large hydroelectric or nuclear power plants. At the upper end of human technologies was the awesome first stage of a Saturn V rocket. In five separate engines, it consumed 15 tons of fuel per second to generate 190 billion watts of power. How much power can humanity marshal? And how much do we need? 
Long before the launch of the Space Age, visionaries began to imagine what it would take to advance into the community of galactic civilizations. In the 1960s, the Soviet scientist Nikolai Kardashev speculated that a level one civilization would acquire the technology needed to harness all the power available on a planet like Earth. According to one calculation, we are 0.16% of the way there. This is based on British Petroleum's estimate of total world oil consumption, some 11 billion tons in 2007. Humans today generate about two and a half trillion watts of electrical power. How does that stack up to the power generated by planet Earth? Deep inside our planet, the radioactive decay of elements such as uranium and thorium generates 44 trillion watts of power. As this heat rises to the surface, it drives the movement of Earth's crustal plates and powers volcanoes. Remarkably, that's just a fraction of the energy released by a large hurricane in the form of rain. At the storm's peak, it can rise to 600 trillion watts. A hurricane draws upon solar heat collected in tropical oceans in the summer. You have to jump another power of 10 to reach the estimated total heat flowing through Earth's atmosphere and oceans from the equator to the poles. And another two to get the power received by the Earth from the Sun at 174 quadrillion watts. Believe it or not, there's one human technology that has exceeded this level. The AN-602 hydrogen bomb was detonated by the Soviet Union on October 30th, 1961. It unleashed some 1400 times the combined power of the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs. With a blast yield of up to 57 million tons of TNT, it generated 5.3 trillion trillion watts if only for a tiny fraction of a second. That's 5.3 Yotta Watts, we have made it to start. a term that will come in handy as we now One. begin to ascend the power scales of the universe. Of discovery, a to, the dedication, hard work and to Nikolai Kardashev, a level two civilization would achieve a constant energy output 80 times higher than the Russian superbomb. That's equivalent to the total luminosity of our sun, a medium-sized star that emits 375 yotta watts. However, in the grand scheme of things, our sun is but a cold spark in a hot universe. Look up into southern skies and you'll see the large Magellanic Cloud a satellite galaxy of our Milky Way. Deep within is the brightest star yet discovered. R136A1 is 10 million times brighter than the Sun. Now if that star happened to go supernova, at its peak 
it would blast out photons with a luminosity of around 500 billion yottawatts. To advance to a level 3 civilization, you have to marshal the power of an entire galaxy. The Milky Way, with about 200 billion stars, has an estimated total luminosity of 3 trillion yottawatts. A 3 followed by 36 zeros. The author Isaac Asimov imagined a galaxy-scale civilization in his Foundation series. Galaxia, he called it, is a superorganism that surpasses time and space to draw upon all the matter and energy in a galaxy. But who's to say that's the upper limit for civilizations? To boldly go beyond level 3, a civilization would need to marshal the power of a quasar. A quasar is about a thousand times brighter than our galaxy. Here is where cosmic power production enters a whole new realm based on the physics of extreme gravity. It was Isaac Newton who first defined gravity as the force that pulls the apple down and holds the Earth in orbit around the Sun. Albert Einstein redefined it in his famous general theory of relativity. Gravity isn't simply the attraction of objects like stars and planets, he said, but a distortion of space and time, what he called space-time. If space-time is like a fabric, gravity is the warping of this fabric by a massive object like a star. A planet orbits a star when it's caught in this warped space, like a ball spinning around a roulette wheel. Some scientists began to wonder, if matter became dense enough, could it warp space to such an extreme that nothing could escape its gravity, not even light? With so much power being emitted from such a small area, scientists suspected that quasars were actually being powered by black holes. How a totally dark object can do this has been narrowed by decades of observations and theory. If a black hole spins, it can turn into a violent cosmic tornado. Gas and stars begin to flow in along a rapidly rotating disk. The spinning motion of this so-called accretion disk generates magnetic fields that twist up and around. These fields can channel some of the inflowing matter out into a pair of high-energy beams, or jets. Gas and dust nearby catch the brunt of this energy, growing hot and bright enough to be seen billions of light-years away. Amazingly, the power of a black hole can rise to even greater extremes at the moment of its birth. As a giant star ages, heavy elements like iron gradually build up in its core. As its gravity grows more intense, the star begins to shrink until it reaches a critical threshold. Its core literally collapses in on itself. That causes the star to explode in a supernova. And now, in death, 
the star can unleash gravity's true fury. In the violence of the star's death, gravity can cause its massive core to collapse to a point, forming a black hole. In some rare cases, the newborn monster powers a jet that accelerates to within a tiny fraction of the speed of light. For a few minutes, these so-called gamma ray bursts are known to be the brightest events since the Big Bang. Three orders of magnitude above a quasar at a billion billion yottawatts, a 10 with 42 zeros. Remarkably, they are still not the most powerful events known. Albert Einstein's equations contained an astonishing prediction. That when massive bodies accelerate or whip around each other, they can stir up the normally smooth fabric of space-time. They produce a series of waves that move outward, like ripples on a pond. Scientists are now hoping to detect these gravitational waves and verify Einstein's prediction using precision lasers and some of the most perfect large-scale vacuums ever created. At the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, known as LIGO, they are hoping to record the collision of ultra-dense remnants of dead stars known as neutron stars and of black holes. According to computer simulations, as two black holes spiral into a fateful embrace, the energy carried by each gravity wave rises five orders of magnitude above a gamma ray burst to a hundred billion trillion times the power of our sun. Does the collision of black holes define the known power limits of our universe? Perhaps not. As turbulent as the environment of a black hole might be, its true power may well lie deep in its core. A black hole's mass is enshrouded within a dark sphere called the event horizon. Since the 1920s, Scientists have described the mathematics of the event horizon as the equivalent of a waterfall. It's the point of no return, beyond which water falls freely into the gorge. At the event horizon of a black hole,